I'm Sujita Vidal. I'm a trustee of Moneyback Foundation. We are a not-for-profit organization engaged in consumer protection, literacy, and advocacy. I want to start by welcoming Mr. Ali Narayan to this very unique present. And with this, I'm going to request Devashish Basu to introduce Mr. Narayan for me, and then we we'll start the proceedings. Good evening, uh, dear Moneyback Foundation members and friends. It's my immense pleasure to introduce Mr. J. Hari Narayan, Chairman of Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority. Mr. Hari Narayan was actually born in Mumbai in 1948 and studied in Delhi and Chennai and joined the Indian Administrative Service sometime in 1970. In his long and distinguished career, he has been heads of several state level corporations in Andhra Pradesh. He was appointed the Chief Secretary of Andhra Pradesh in 2006, from where he retired in February 2008. He was the IRTA Chairman in June 2008. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Hari Narayan, Chairman IRB. Ms. Dilal, Ms. Devishit Basu, members of the Money Life Foundation Trust, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a pleasure to be here this afternoon to talk to you and the members of the Foundation on various issues, which uh, Sucheta had mentioned. And I'd like to thank you for the guarantee of safe passage. <laughs> <laughs> Jambi, I often used to read uh, comics on the Second World War era. And invariably, if a spy goes somewhere, if it's caught somewhere, invariably, you know, these guys have offered safe passage. So one person was offered safe passage. But only thing, we ended up in the coffin in the other side. <laughs> so safe passage doesn't guarantee life. <laughs> But I'm sure in money lies ahead. Life is not an issue. <laughs> money might be. <laughs> but I haven't said that. But I haven't said that. I really uh, uh, was uh, happy to uh, have a chance to talk to members of the foundation apart from my good friend Mr. Mahindra, who is also my boss, and Mr. Vicky Srinivasan's uh, suggestions. We also have a great respect for the kind of articles and reportage which. Uh, Mrs. Dalal and the team are having a doing, and all of you are more aware of it than I am. And when I come here, she suggested uh, one of two topics to talk about. <coughs> and the topic I thought that I might talk about, the first one, of course, was policyholder grievances and that kind of thing. And the second one was about health. And in fact, universal health coverage in India. And I thought that's an area where really I need to, uh, we need to think about, we need to work together about what exactly we mean about universal coverage and health. So while I will be talking about insurance and insurance and health, it's only tangential. What I'm really talking about is universal cover of health in India. And this is a topic which is very much a live topic today. Uh, is being discussed at the highest level of policy making worlds. But unfortunately I don't see so much of it in the in the public domain. I dare say we have greater reporting of the problems leading the American Health Insurance Foundation, especially after Obama had made Obamacare and so on and so forth, than a corresponding concern about what we are doing about healthcare and health insurance in India. It just shows a, a, a sense of priorities which we particularly assign to a debate of this And I thought I'd like to take you a bit off air of where we stand in that. The latest uh, concern about healthcare, universalization of healthcare, was a paper which we, was, uh, was based on a committee which was set up by the Planning Commission. Uh, the committee headed by the eminent Dr. Srinath Reddy, who, as you know, is the Chair of the International Association of Cardiologists and so on, a very learned man, a professor in the Orthodox Institute of Patrick Mother Day. And that committee had uh, prepared a report and submitted the same to the uh, uh, Planning Commission about the vision of that committee for healthcare in India. How exactly are we going? And what is the direction uh, that committee suggests that the Planning Commission should take? The first thing the committee said is that it cannot, healthcare in India cannot depend on insurance. And in fact, insurance should be kept outside healthcare. The second, second element of their recommendation is that 
The country must evolve, the set of experts must sit and evolve. A minimum health packet, which will have various elements, no doubt, experts will work on that packet. And this minimum health packet must be offered by the government to every citizen in the country. And the package must be made deliverable either by, uh, uh, not either by, in various government medical establishments all over the country and also by such of the private establishments at my willing to join. The private establishments, of course, will be paid predetermined rates for different procedures, etc., etc., by the government out of the government budget. And, but at the provider level, whether it be a government hospital or whether it be a private hospital, there will not be any financial transaction as between the person receiving care and the person offering that care. Broadly, this is the scheme which the Public Health Foundation has commended for consideration of the private action. I totally disagree with it. I don't think that the scheme is going to be much different from what we are today. I mean, if you have a look at the burden of public health services in India, they have always been mandated to provide complete coverage and free for all comers. And that's how the public hospitals, the general hospitals, the civil hospitals, all of them, in principle, have been constructed on that basic premise. It seemed to have worked very well when numbers were small or demands were much less on it. But certainly, saying that they are going to turn the clock back and then get back that same kind of a system in place, I doubt whether that's really going to happen or whether it's going to offer any better services than uh, the, uh, the level of services we have come to expect and need. I don't think that's, that's possible. And that's one of the reasons why I don't agree with the approach taken by this particular paper. But I think the nation requires a greater debate on how we go into this. And that is the subject matter of one of the, in fact, a question which was raised uh, a little while ago with a group of senior citizens who wish to raise these kind of issues. And that's going to be the balance of what I wish to talk about. In India, we have had very interesting examples of large-scale insurance-based health coverage. Uh, one example was, of course, the one started by the Yashashri group in Karnataka, which is largely a community-based, uh, it's not really an insurance. It is more or less a community fund which is made available to, to parties who wish to take advantage of it, members of that particular fund, and the uh, Narayana Hridayala system of hospitals were providing outstanding care to those recipients of that. It is sort of internally subsidized. A uh, person who could afford to pay a little more, and persons who couldn't pay even get free services. But that was the genesis of the SSP type of model, which was then articulated further in Andhra Pradesh through the arbitrary model which was the insurance model. That is, the government paid the, the uh, uh, premium on behalf of uh, large sections of the population to the insurance and to an insurance company. And this was done based on a bidding process. So it was, let us say, uh, uh, the price discovery was very transparent. And you'd be surprised that the prices offered for uh, coverage under this scheme amount to something like 79 or 80 rupees per capita. And mind you, that would cover practically any kind of tertiary uh, intervention which is required, including knee joint replacements, kidneys, replacements, implants, all that. And all for 80 rupees per capita. That's what it cost. Uh, that's what the uh, winning paid amount was. They expanded that, district by district and so on, over a period of time. And every year it was being paid and the prices were around this rate. Sometimes it was 76, sometimes 82, 81, etc. Based upon this concept, the government of India had launched what is called the RSBY, Rashtriya Swayam Dima Yojana. The idea being that in states which buy into the scheme, the government of India gives a, a, a meets about 80% of the cost of the premium. Again, through a bid out process. And even on the RSB by scheme, the, there the coverage is not done for capita, it is done for family. And the latest prices, I think, are on the order of 400 rupees per family, which again come down, comes down to about 80 rupees per capita. So 80, 90 rupees per capita seems to be the kind of 
uh, insurance cover. So I'm giving you these numbers because uh, it will sort of anchor what we are going to say in some kind of uh, uh, reality. So the price at which these, uh, oh yes, I must forget, I never forget. In Arugishti, that is the state government of Andhra Pradesh scheme, the coverage is largely on tertiary care. When I say tertiary, I mean surgical intervention. And there the surgical intervention could be anything, as I have just mentioned, a wide variety of uh, uh, the kind of interventions uh, possible. But in the government of India scheme, even primary and secondary are covered. But the limit is 30,000 rupees. So that covers uh, conditions of fever, for example. It will cover non-surgical kind of medical care required. It will cover even normal pregnancies and deliveries. So all the usual burden of, of life, let us say, is covered under that RSPY scheme. Whereas in the state government of Andhra Pradesh scheme, it is largely at the tertiary end. That is only where it leads to a procedure being conducted of an operating plan, excluding, of course, pregnancy. There are intermediate schemes which have been adopted like uh, in the uh, state government of Nadu. They have a scheme very similar to the RFP uh, system. I understand that something very similar on these lines is also being considered and implemented or proposed to be implemented in the government of Maharashtra. So what I'm trying to say is that across the country, different states for various reasons are moving in the direction of having an insurance-based solution for meeting the cost of health. Given this background, to my mind, the approach taken by the Public Health Foundation of India in the paper they have submitted to the Planning Commission is, I think, really out of sync with what is reality and what might really happen. But I think more people, and particularly I would appeal to the members of the Foundation, Life Foundation, to consider this matter, perhaps uh, have greater studies or uh, interact with far greater experts than, than I am, and perhaps come up with a position to enrich this debate which is going on and which needs to go on in more and more uh, in a detailed manner. Coming back, what is the issue? I would say? It's like this. One of the criticisms of the Arabishri program was that it focused too much on the tertiary end. And the criticism was that bulk of the budget of the state government of Andhra Pradesh Health Department was primarily going to meet this 80 rupees per capita. Andhra Pradesh has a population of something like 8 crores, or of which 4 crores was a uh, 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 poverty line, the target group, and so on. So at 80 rupees a go on 4 crores, they are looking at something like 320 crores as the premium of go, and another 50, 60 crores of administrative costs and so forth. We are looking at around 4 crores. So the state government, rather, the criticism of this project was out of the state budget, 400 crores is going ultimately to make a billing payments, not in government hospitals, but in private hospitals like the Yashoda chain or Apollo chain, forget the name of the great hospitals, but hospitals of this nature. And that was the criticism, saying it is not fair that we do this only to subsidize rather to pump in costs in hospitals of that nature. And that was its prime criticism. But the point is this, if you have a look at healthcare in India and what has happened, uh, when I joined service in 1970, the big thing was that we should have these PHCs in villages and in rural areas people would, you know, go to that place and so on. But now the fact remains, nobody goes to a PHC. See, in states, in several parts of the country and in several geographies, local transportation has improved considerably. Even personal transportation has improved considerably. So as you're going to the PHC, the guy takes a bus or sits on a scooter or hikes a ride or takes an auto rickshaw and goes to the nearest town which may be just 20 kilometers away. Where you've got a far greater area of specialists there. So it's no longer a type where you know people in rural areas and so on, they didn't know about this, that and the other. And he's not going to, going to be happy with care which he thinks is substandard or suboptimal. So there's a demand issue also on, on questions of that nature. That is, there is a demand that people would like themselves to be treated in hospitals of this nature, what might usually be called five-star hospitals. That's not always, not always the case. But people would like that. On the other hand, if you have a look at 
The weaknesses of this, apart from the criticism about the burden on the state budget, the weakness is it does not attend or does not uh, uh, cover uh, non-critical non-critical intervention kind of uh, uh, cover which is required. Like, like for example, pregnancies, uh, illnesses, other kinds of routine kind of, uh, 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 let's say, uh, ill health which people suffer from. So I would say that ideally what we might require as a country as a whole is something like an artificial plus an RSDY kind of cover. That is to cover the spectrum from primary to tertiary care with an appropriate um, uh, insurance. <coughs> and assuming both of them cost 80, that is 160 per capita, it is not going to cost 160 when you plug the two. That's not how insurance pricing works. Off the top, I would say that if you plug the two, the premium would be of the order of 125 or 130 rupees per capita. The second question is this. This money would be paid for or purchased by the state. But the state, even today, in the states of in the RSBY program or in the various other states, they need to build only for a certain section of society. A section of society who they believe have a very poor financial base and consequently have to be supported by such intervention in the state. Fair enough. Even if we assume 40 percent, there's a debate I know whether India is 40 percent or 4 or 32 or 29.7 and so on and so forth. But even if we assume that half the country is going to be met by support from a budget of this nature, the question is, what about the other half? And there, I think what we should be able to do is build up a scheme where persons can buy into the scheme. I mean, if it is going to cost 120 rupees, to buy a cover which takes from primary to a secondary when done in bulk. I don't see why somebody else can't buy into that scheme. If not at 120, maybe at 150, or maybe at 160, or whatever it is, but certainly at a price which is exceedingly affordable for people in the country today. And I think that's the way to go. One of the reasons why insurance might work at this level is what they call an acquisition cost. That is, for an individual to actually, I mean, for an agent to go about and actually sell an insurance, he needs to talk to 10 people before he can make one hit. And therefore, he has to be paid a suitable compensation, an agent's commission, if you will. And so on. So there's a whole process of um, advertisements, all kinds of things, which get into the whole cost of acquisition. And cost of acquisitions can tend to be very high. Off the cuff, I would say, if you look at an individual level, 30% of the first year's premium would perhaps be the cost of acquisition. That's not just the commission, but everything else associated with any given product. So the point is that if individuals can add in to a nationwide scheme, the question is who's going to do the bulking? So what I think should happen is, in different states, we should have a portal where those members of the public for whom, who have the means to pay uh, uh, whatever it is, 100 rupees, 400, 300, whatever is that magic number, whoever means to do that. They will lock into the port to transfer the money to the port to, such that there is a bulking taking place there, and that is then transferred to insurance companies. So the advantage which they get by bulking through a government payment is in a sense captured in this kind of a mechanism. Mechanics apart, I therefore think the way to go forward is that in India, we require to have a system like the R50 and uh, uh, RSBY suitably mixed together and paid for for a certain section of the population by the central budget and a buy-in provision for everybody else open to all in the country. And I think if we do that, what will then happen is there will be limits on expenses and so on which are paid into the scheme of things. Currently, for example, if we take the RUP history, the limit is 1,50,000. There may be outliers, however, and sometimes it does happen, where individual bills of about 2 lakhs are also sent. In certain very complicated kind of cases, that is required, that is done. So there will be a limit at some point of time. So what individuals can do who might wish to get a coverage in addition or on top of these 2 lakhs is you can buy a regular insurance cover from insurance company with having the initial 2 lakhs which is meant from this system. So it's only on top of that. 
and therefore the premiums have become considerably more affordable. So the answer to some of the questions which were raised by the senior citizen forum where we had a discussion is an approach of this nature. Unless we do it in this way, it will be difficult really to manage the kind of cost and manage the kind of cover which we require. As we go along, there will be most of other issues which has to be addressed. For instance, the RSPY and the ROV free scheme, both of them, they work fairly well because of a very sound IT backup in terms of information exchange, tracking, collection, auditing and all the rest of it. There's a tremendous amount of fraud which has to be checked. I mean, it's all very well when we're talking in a, in a forum primarily of consumers, but we'll be deluding ourselves in believing that, you know, that consumers may not also be fraud service. And we should be, particularly when we're dealing with an issue such as a, a financial matter, that we, and that too in the insurance set of things, we should keep that as a very important uh, uh, element to be handled. Not that they are going to reject the whole scheme because of the odd, odd ball hanging around, yes. But nevertheless, to be aware that that exists and to set up appropriate systems to, to keep it at manageable levels. I don't think those can be eliminated 100%, no. But certainly, by, by good management and what the RSBY management has shown, it is indeed possible to keep those kinds of uh, uh, fraudulent practices under check and keep the whole scheme fairly healthy. So gentlemen, I would say, is sensible health insurance all, for all possible in India? I would say most certainly yes. I would say most certainly yes, it is indeed possible. And because we have the great advantage of a, of a multiplier, everything you multiply by 1.2 billion, so it's a hell of a lot. And that's the advantage we should take, take and we, that we should fully capitalize on. And uh, having said that, having said that, <coughs> There are two, three other elements in this entire scheme which we need to look at. If you are looking at the gamut of health and health costs, you will have a set of costs which have to deal with uh, the cost of medicines, drugs, and uh, you know elements such as that. You will have, of course, the capital, the sunk, uh, sunk uh, capex costs and the interest costs there of the stone and mortar hospital as such and all the equipment. You also have the cost attributable to expert skills, maybe nurses and surgeons and uh, anesthetician and all that. Then you have a whole set of costs associated with diagnosis, various types of tests and so forth. A look at these figures suggests that the area where a good part of expenditure takes place is actually this diagnosis. It is possible to control the price of medicines by shifting through to you know generic formulations and the beginning has been made in the new types of shops which are mandated to be open and hopefully that will make available uh, uh, life-saving uh, medicines at affordable prices. And sometimes that may not be possible but perhaps the drug controller will take steps as he has recently done in, in favor of one important uh, uh, cancer uh, drug and I think we know about that. So it is possible to manage the cost of medicines currently, steps are being taken. The cost of experts, that is an area which I think would be unfair for society to manage. We did try through the Companies Act, for example, various types of uh, uh, payments and all that were limited by that act, but that mechanism and that system didn't particularly uh, work. So I think trying to control that cost is best left to market forces about what that prices might be. That leaves the cost of, of diagnostics. And I think these tests and other things, I think it is possible, even within the present system, to cut. In fact, under the present system, where a test is required as part of any given hospitalization procedure under an insurance contract, those are covered anyway. It is only where, for the purposes of diagnosis, when you are going in for a consultancy, if standard home tests are required, which is not yet covered. I think if we take an approach to insurance in this manner, I'm quite sure that uh, uh, Mr. Bachchi and his group of very competent people and similarly uh, 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 other companies will offer products of that nature at affordable prices. And therefore in that context then, it should indeed be possible 
to cover the entire concerns which we have as to how we move down this necessarily doctrinal spot. That's what I wish to say, gentlemen, on the subject. And I'm very happy to assure you two or three things. I mean, uh, yeah. One is that these questions which uh, Money Life Foundation has so thoughtfully put together were good enough to have forwarded to the IRPA uh, about uh, a week to ten days ago. We have had a careful look. And several of these are addressable and will be addressed. But some are not. For example, there is a suggestion here that uh, fundamentally in the insurance space, we should, uh, we should dissolve banks from having anything to do with insurance. Now, I may tell you that uh, I like the idea very much. But, and there are societies like, for example, Canada, which prohibit banks from, from selling insurance companies. In fact, the law there prohibits the sale of an insurance within 100 feet of a bank. <laughs> you can't even sell it on the street. So they don't want any way for that on the bank. But, that's one, uh, but in India, I don't think that's feasible. So radical solutions like let's ban the banks from uh, insurance and so on, I don't think really are uh, workable. And therefore, I don't think I would like to spend much time on, on uh, discussing issues like that. But there are other questions, and I will assure you, uh, Mr. Dalal and your team that they will they will address it and we will run this uh, group. Gentlemen, to once again I would say uh, health insurance for all is possible, certainly. But whether it's going to be sensible or not, it depends on the kind of debate which bodies such as you can engage and uh, must engage in consumer groups and so on. Maybe what I've said is perhaps uh, not right. Absolutely. And maybe if the Public Health Foundation is right, though I doubt it. Maybe there's a third solution somewhere, or a number of solutions. But what I'm really trying to suggest is, this is, this is a debate that is important to get into. And if you have a look at the numbers, they're not right today. Even if we take 1.2 billion, and even if we take 100 rupees or 200 rupees, we are looking only at an outlay of something like 24,000 crores. Now, 24,000 crores is uh, is uh, less than a third of what is the outlay for the end for example. So in terms of dimensions of money we are talking about this, there is not stupendous or good or anything like that. And mind you, out of the 24,000 crores we have said only half to be met by the government because half the population requires that kind of support. So we are really looking at maybe 12, maybe 15,000 crores order starting. And of course, it will grow as we go. That would happen. But I think it's eminently doable, but more importantly, I would once again urge bodies such as Money Life and their members and so on to encourage people to look at it, to look at it from different angles. Because right now people are looking at, at, uh, at uh, solutions to this particular problem. And I do hope uh, we will find it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity and the Money Life Foundation for having uh, embraced this platform. And thank you very much for your patience.